Well, we'll get started by reminding uh, everybody in the audience that if you have a question, uh, please put it in the Q&A, not the chat. All the questions for the speaker should go to the Q&A. And at the end of the talk, we'll go through those um, at time available to answer those. Uh, speaking of the speaker, um, I'm, I'm delighted that Lee Metcalf is here uh, again. Uh, she's done a serious seminar before, and she's back to do another one with just an, a, a wonderful title, Grep for Evil, which um, could be interpreted a couple different ways. But um, Lee is a, a scientist with the Software Engineering Institute and the CERT at Carnegie Mellon and has uh, quite a resume for work in um, vulnerability detection uh, and uh, vulnerabilities in general and incident response. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to say that uh, we're co-authors of a book and it was a delightful experience working with her. I'm sure you will enjoy her talk today. And again, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them afterwards. Without further ado, the delightful Dr. Lee Metcalf. Thank you, staff. I hope I, uh, you know, rise to the challenge of being called the delightful. <laughs> so yes, the title of my talk is called Grep for Evil. Uh, so I'm going to start the talk before I get into the actual slides with kind of the background of how this talk happened. I'm often handed a pile of data and told, tell us something about this data incident response data, DNS data, malware. It's all just, no one knows anything about it, hands it to me and says, go. Um, I do not start with summary statistics. I mean, it's kind of hard to do a summary when you have a pile of domain names and say, here's the average length. That doesn't really tell me anything. Um, here's the average domain name really doesn't tell me anything. So I just start when I'm handed these things with, I'm going to look at the data. I'm going to open the file and moor it. I'm going to um, maybe even grep it, but I just start by looking at the data. When I started at CERT, the first thing they handed me were the top level zone files. They'd been collecting .com, .net, .org, .mobi, and .biz for a while. No one had done anything with it. I was the new person. So they said, here, go. And I said, okay. So I started by just looking in these files. I mean, there's not really anything you can do when you look, someone hands you these huge files, but just look at them. So COM, for example, at the time, 300 plus million domains. That's not very useful looking at all those name server records, but at the bottom of the file is a bunch of name servers to see the whole process. So I just started looking at those and I noticed that when I was looking at one zone file and then I'd look at the one from the next day, I'd say, hey, this name server changed IP addresses. Well, I've been in industry and I have changed IP addresses of a name server. And it was memorable enough for everyone involved that the next time we had to do something like that, we changed routing. <laughs> we didn't bother with changing the IP address of the name server. We just kind of fixed the routing and it was a lot less trouble. And I went, huh, okay, someone lost some sleep that night for them. So then I looked at the next file and said, hey, wait a minute, this name server has changed IP addresses again. This is weird. This is not something you do for fun, changing IP addresses. So at that point, I turned to my favorite Unix command, grep, and said, okay, how many times has this one particular name server changed IP addresses? Well, it was almost daily. So I said, okay, that's weird. Then I looked at the IP addresses themselves and realized they were in user space. They were in Comcast space or any other ISP that users use. They weren't actually, you know, name server IP addresses. So that actually turned into a project. At the end result, we discovered it was mostly pharma domains using these things. And um, skipping a bit of time, I started to journal. Uh, but that's skipping quite a few steps. But the whole thing started because I just looked at the data. So I was handed a bunch of passive DNS data. We were collecting it daily. And they said, 
hey, Lee, find things. And I said, okay. So I ended up using grep again after I looked at it to know what I was looking for. So the next slide, we have legalese. There will be a test afterwards. I hope everyone's read it. So the other thing I used to do, uh, I used to read RFCs for fun. And I know there are some people in the audience probably laughing at me at doing that, but hey, it's a good way of learning what the internet's going forward and what's happening and how what they were thinking when they first put it together. But RFCs are the way to go. The greatest RFCs of all though, are the April Fool's RFCs. And RFC 3514 is one of those where they define the evil bit. Of course, if the evil bit was actually in use, then hey, we wouldn't have a hard job anymore and that would be really boring. So we have a hard job because no one's actually using the evil bit. I did go back and look at some notes. Uh, RFC 1097 is an April Fool's for Telnet subliminal messaging. And then there's one from last year on an AI sarcasm detector. It is 9405. And uh, staff, I think we should work on putting those two together. Uh, anyway, back to this. Firewalls, packet filters, intrusion detection systems, and the like have often had this trouble of distinguishing between packets. We define a security flag, and the security flag is going to say, this is evil. Yay, make it so easy. Well, maybe not. So, I think that's it. I didn't look for the evil bit in packets, but I did in domain names. Because like I said, I was just looking at this data, and I said, hey, wait a minute. Why does this domain exist? I mean, I had grep. So let's look for DDoS because I found this one. EasyDDoS.com for selling DDoSes. I, at the time, I had a separate system because I used to make IT a little nuts. This is a warning when you're in you know, cybersecurity. Occasionally, IT will have this phone calls to you of, did you really mean to do this? And my answer was always yes. So they just gave me a system that they didn't monitor. And it was off on a separate network, so I wouldn't harm anyone else. And I said, hey, what's this easy DDoS.com? Maybe it's DDoS defending, and I'm being really, really hopeful. But no... It's a way of selling DDoSes and it's under rubles. Now, I did a lot of this work back in 2018. So this is like an older picture of EasyDDoS.com. Does it still exist? Yep. <laughs> yep. And I don't know if, uh, you know, they got a new software des web designer. I don't know what happened, but they now have this website. And it's also a bit more, and $90 for 24 hours of attack. Um, that would be quite the attack. Uh, then we have another one. This one doesn't exist anymore. That's the other problem with doing this research, as much as I wasn't really research, but we'll call it research. That's the other problem with this, is these sites came and went so fast. Like I found this one and took the picture and then I went back a week later because I had a question about what I had seen and it was gone already. Then we have ddosteam.com. Order DDoS is quick and professionally and, and high quality DDoS services around the clock and here's some ICQ numbers and 24 seven, 365 days a year, you can get a DDoS, yay team, yeah or attack DDoS.info, which claims to be even better than the other guys. Of course they do. And here's the 2024 version, they're still up. And I think their prices are, well, shoot, I didn't catch the prices last time, but I think the prices are up a little more, which these things happen over the years. And it's, um, we are really pen testers. That's their current thing of we're pen testers, we're not DDoSers. And then this is my favorite DDoS, DDoS.Ninja. I have found the DDoS Ninja and he was coming soon. And I have to admit, I went back to that site quite often to see if I would get anything past the DDoS Ninja, who's really cute, but he never showed up and the domain went away fairly quickly and I was, you know, not happy, but I went looking for the DDoS Ninja again in 2024 and I found this. And I honestly say, I think I prefer the previous graphic 
to this DDoS ninja. Although this is kind of a cute DDoS ninja, you know, it's fun. So let's digress a little bit into DDoS and talk about who DDoS is and why they DDoS. Because that's kind of like, if you want to stop the process from happening, you need to understand what's going on. So my coworkers and I had some meetings and we talked about it. And our first thing is a DDoS is a political economic act. People DDoS because they're mad at someone. I used to be in industry. I spent 10 years or so in industry and I was actually woken up a few times by a DDoS. And I will tell you the people usually DDoSed at that time were porn sites. The DDoS would last maybe 15 minutes. And then I would be very peeved because I was woken up from a dead sleep to deal with the fact that it went down and came back up again. And there was nothing I could do about it other than whine and go back to sleep. So in 20, 2007, Estonia was hit by a revenge attack. In 2012, Spam House was hit by a pretty big attack. And this attack, as I understand it, was for revenge. Someone, Spam House blocked someone they didn't like being blocked, so they DDoSed them. Hong Kong was censorship. BBC 2016, I believe, was a terror attack. Then we have 2016, which was to revenge, sell a service, money, but it's basically the poopy head attack. I don't like you. I'm going to throw packets at you. Or we're going to try to test our service, as they think the two against the railways were. And there was a competition economic gain attack in 2018. And the providers, the DDoS gives you asymmetric power for high profile results, right? Knocking off spam house was news for ages. I heard about it like every conference I went to for a while that you hear of it, spam house got hit, hit by a DDoS. Oh no, what do we do? DDoS is also surprisingly cheap. The barrier to entry is very low. As we saw on the previous page, I could DDoS someone for less than a hundred bucks. I'm mad at you enough. I'll spend a hundred bucks. I'll knock you off a net. Yay team. The UIs, there are UIs everywhere for these things. It's not very hard to DDoS someone. It doesn't require a lot of knowledge for someone to DDoS. And there are free stressors, also known as DDoS providers. I have slides later of you can get a free test DDoS for five minutes for free. We'll show you what we can do. Yeah. Before the FBI took down the Alpha Bay, I found a DDoS. This is on the dark web, I found it as low as $5. And then when I was doing some searching online, I found it as low as $10. And this was beyond grepping the domain names. I went, okay, what am I missing in my domain names? Because passive DNS, you know, is a snapshot of a very narrow area. It doesn't tell me what everyone's doing. It's a very useful uh, data source, but it doesn't tell you what everyone's doing. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go out and buy these to see what I get. Something, 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 IRB, something. <sighs> also known as my boss saying, you want to what? <laughs> and yes, my boss really did say that. So I will digress a minute again and explain why I wanted DDoSes. So I work at the Software Engineering Institute, which is a federally funded research and development center. And when you work for an FFRDC, there tends to be ideas that tend to come around periodically. Uh, like DNS was a very big thing for a while, and then it kind of dropped off of people caring about DNS, and now it's working its way back that they're going to start asking me to look at DNS again. Another one of these is DDoS defense. That's one of those things that it's like, I don't know, I should time this or something, but it's a periodic thing of every once in a while, we're suddenly into the... We want you, you to give us our your opinion on DDoS defense and because we're funding things and we need to know if these are good things to fund. And then never goes quiet again and then it comes back around again. So this was about the time one of those was coming around and people are like, we must defend against DDoS. And so I said, okay, what does a DDoS look like? And I don't mean it's just a lot of traffic because I've seen those, it's just a lot of traffic if you're monitoring your traffic, what you see is a huge spike and then it goes down. What the actual traffic looks like was interesting to me. 
Is it NTP reflection? Is it DNS reflection? Is it just a ping attack? Is it a send flood? Is it, you know, trying to hug the website to death by opening up all the connections? What is the DDoS that we're trying to defend against, aside from the words, lots of traffic? So I thought we could find a place that would host us an instrument in it. CERT has a nice instrumentation for this kind of thing called Silk. It's a network traffic man monitoring and analysis platform. And all we would do is set that up, buy ourselves some DDoS, get DDoSed, and then have some idea of what traffic we're actually looking at. However, first of all, the IRB really did have to get involved because um, you know when you're DDoSing an IP address, you're not just affecting the IP address, you're affecting the whole network. And then there was the whole, I work for a federally funded entity. Our money comes from the federal government. And my bosses, you want to what, was mainly because I wanted to give federal money to these DDoS providers and pay for a DDoS so that we could instrument against them better. And that whole middle part made everyone go, you want to what? So um, that never happened, but I'd love to see it happen someday. There was actually a paper out of NYU of people buying DDoSes, but their end result was not what I was looking for. I was looking for what the traffic is. They were looking for how often do we actually get a DDoS out of buying it. So the traditional economic model for a DDoS, you have an attacker, a nice guy up here in red. They have an investment, economic or otherwise, or they're just, you know, some dudes with a web form that they're paying someone else to do it for them. But they have a way of attacking you. They attack you with their infrastructure. And here's the victim. And the poor victim gets knocked offline. And everyone complains and ha bad things happen, as we've seen. And that's the traditional model. Then what we came up with were anti-DDoS vendors. So way back in the dark ages of the internet, well, not so dark ages of the internet, um, one of the biggest DDoSes that I had to deal with was called the sin flood. And when and it's, defense came out for the sin flood, we were all celebrating, and I'm sure there were quite a few victims that would have paid good money for that sin flood. But now we have a variety of anti-DDoS defenders, excuse me, vendors to protect ourselves from this DDoS. So the victim makes an investment to the anti-DDoS vendor, whereas the attacker is going to hit the DDoS vendor and, hey, the victim's safe because they hit the anti-DDoS. Yay, team. Keep in mind that the attacker's economic in, uh, investment, we looked at this, they don't really need to actually have their own money. I mean, people steal the credit cards all the time and buy a DDoS and a stolen credit card. Where was the money they needed to invest to actually do this? Didn't happen. So anti-DDoS stops the DDoS and everything's good. Everyone party, right? Yay. But we have a trend. We have the victim getting the anti-DDoS defender. Yay. What we have also is the attacker using anti-DDoS defenders. It may be for their infrastructure. We don't think so. We don't know. But we do know that the attackers are using anti-DDoS defenders. And there's an investment, investment, and both sides are using it. Let's go back up a slide. Both sides are using anti-DDoS defender. I have some slides with some nice, pretty pictures that illustrate this further. But this is not a good thing. This is very much not a good thing. I have taken this conferences where I was told that the FBI was looking into it. I do not know any further if that was actually, I don't know what happened after that. All I know is I was told that much. Sorry. I wish I could tell you that there was a big story and everything happened and everything was great. But both sides are defect, investing in it. And this is what I call a say what? Now what? Well, we need to get the anti-DDoS people to stop selling to the attackers, but that's a problem that I'm not into solving at all. So more slides. We have some lovely pretty slides. 
want to buy a DDoS. This is booters, booters and stressors. IP booter, great way of buying a DDoS. Stressed networks booters. Log in, sign up with a dashboard even. You can watch the attack happen in real time. Isn't that totally cool? Yes, I want to use the stressed booter and knock um, someone off the net, but not SPAF. I like SPAF. Or we have a DDoS for sale. Psst. Look at this. All members can enjoy up to 200 megabytes for 300 seconds for free. If I create an account, now I did not create any accounts on here because my boss back to saying, I want to what? He was worried that somehow I might get tracked down. And I said, no problem. I'm just mainly spending my days in the office laughing hysterically as I find these things. So free DDoS. You know, imagine using this for gaming. You're playing a game online and you want to knock that other guy offline 300, for 300 seconds. You can do it for free. But there's no economic gain for you in that, right? You're just getting to win the game. Meteor stressor. And uh, low prices, anonymous, secured, everything you want in a DDoS provider. But what happens when I go there? This is DDoS protection by uh, security. What was it? Excuse me. Knock security. I had to look up close because my glasses wouldn't focus. But the anti-DDoS people are protecting these people. It's kind of weird. Is it still happening in 2024? Yep. Here's Cloudflare. It's a lovely slide. And I ran into more than one Cloudflare splash screen as I was preparing this. It's still happening. And this is stressor.zone. The best, best free, right? You want a free IP stressor. And there's also a China, Chinese ISP supporting these things. And then it's one thing to allow the DDoS vendors to sell, right? We're going to find all these websites and say, hey, someone's selling it. And I said, what are other ways that DDoS is being supported online? We don't, we as defenders don't want to defend, support DDoS. But online, you can find a lot of support for DDoSing, like YouTube videos. And... More YouTube videos. I think I actually kind of like this one. It has a really cool thing. Although I think someone watched um, The Punisher a few too many times uh, to make this splash page. And then there's another one. This one is, you know, I don't know what, 1980s version of a DDoS look. And this is one I found the other day. I found a YouTube video, how to DDoS using a batch file. Everything we want to know about DDoS, but we're afraid to ask, is pretty much available online. We also have blog sites. Free booter available on a blog spot. And then uh, blogspot.ru site. This is no longer exist. Blogspot.ru is now something completely different because I went back to see if I could find this one again and I can't. But, um, you know, People want to be able to DDoS and it's available everywhere. Want to do your own DDoS? A UDP flash flood. I will admit I have written my own DDoS and I meant to because we had a problem at the time of a mail server falling over under certain load. And so someone had to write the code that took down the mail server so we could figure out why the mail server's SMTP was not handling that load appropriately. So I wrote a program. And at the time, the company I was working for had installations around the world. I installed it on various systems and I hammered our mail server. And I got paid to do that too. That was cool. But it actually, for fun, only turned out to be one line of code that had to be fixed. But still, I had to write a DDoS in order to find the problem. And after that, our mail server would stand up. I've also seen uh, DDoS occur because of improperly written code that wasn't mine. Uh, we were using a backup system and the backup system was supposed to say, if the backup server cannot be reached, wait X amount of seconds and try again. Well, 
for the Linux uh, client code, it turned out that X was set to zero. And so everything was falling offline because every server in our company, it was a rolling backup schedule. So it wasn't like all at once, everyone trying to reach once, because like I said, we were around the world. Um, there was a rolling thing of everyone trying to get through to this backup server that was down to do their backups. Um, I admit I slept through the whole thing, but you know, these things happen. My poor coworkers though, uh, it was a serious, serious DDoS and it was self-inflicted. So it's easy to DDoS yourself. Done it before. There's also, oops, I hit a button. U-boat HTTP. Designed to replicate a full weaponized commercial botnet. And now notice the disclaimer. You should only use it for authorized testing or educational purposes only. And how many people do you think actually read that? I went, oh, cool, I can use this for my own botnet and set up and start making money. Yay, team. It's hard to find these, right? Well, not right now. So I had a passive DNS data set to grab through. I'll do is just grab for DDoS. Now, one of the fun things about grabbing for DDoS is kiddos, K-I-D-D-O-S showed up quite a bit. And there were some other misspellings that would show up quite a bit. So I had to get smarter in my grepping. But essentially what I ended up doing was writing a script to grep and then pipe it through a wget. And if the wget succeeded, then I would actually look at the result. I'm lazy. We like scripting when we're lazy. But when I was redoing this and updating and showing those pictures before, I actually added some more. I didn't have a passive DNS data set to go through anymore. Like I said, FFRDCs tend to have cycles on things and passive DNS is no longer on my uh, to-do list. Although they promised me one of these days real soon now it's coming back. So instead I went to plan B. For all TLD, for every TLD and TLDs, I made the domain with stressor.tld if the domain exists, and then I would take it out afterwards and just open up in incognito mode because I also do not have that server on a uh, unattributed network anymore to keep out of IT's hair. So I did it from home. I can't wait to see IT go nuts over me again. Anyway, I also did some searching on duckduckgo.com because they're a lot better at not filtering results for bad things because I wanted to find all the bad things. We also have DDoS in the news today. I have the most recent Wired, if you can see this, my most recent Wired, uh, covering the Mirai botnet. It looked like Russia. It was three young hackers. I will tell you that, um, for example, when the Oklahoma City bombing happened, there was every possible, it was someone else in the world until we found out it was homegrown terrorism. And when Morai happened, I heard from various coworkers that was everything possible in the world, but what it really was, was some kids in a basement. I mean, it caused all kinds of havoc. It knocked down Amazon. It knocked down Reddit. It knocked down Netflix. I mean, the crying when it knocked down Netflix was amazing eBay, PayPal, Twitter, as it was called back then, Spotify. I mean, Spotify was another one I heard about. Oh my God, I can't listen to my music at work because the Mariah Botnet, or that was not what it was called at the time, but because of the DDoS, I was just getting complaints all over the place. And I was sitting there in the back going, okay. I mean, to put it mildly, it caused a lot of havoc. I mean, there were just a lot of people upset that their movies were interrupted. But it was a lot more than just taking down these popular websites. It took down everything. And it wasn't a nation state. It wasn't a cyber criminal out to make money. Well, actually it was. But what it really was, was some kids in the basement going, I wonder, I want to be cool. I need credibility because, you know, I want to sell my things, which basically you say, yes, I do need money. But it wasn't what we think of as hardened cyber criminals. I have seen examples and talks on cyber criminals, and there are some fascinating stories coming out of East Russia, uh, excuse me, Eastern Europe. Um, that was actually part of our discussion about DDoS originally. So as I said before, I found some DDoS for $5, right? $5 to do a DDoS. 
that's nothing to people in the States for the most part. I mean, that would pay for your computer time to do the DDoS. But in some place like Eastern Europe, that's some place that they can actually make money at doing this kind of thing. So we talked about how we actually attacked this problem and we went round and round in circles. And what came out of it is what comes out of a lot of cybersecurity research. We don't have a data. We don't know how to get the data. We can say, we think this happens, but we cannot prove it. And evidence-based research in cybersecurity is so, so very important. In fact, I highly recommend my second book, called Using Science and Cybersecurity because it's very much about having evidence for your research. Just sitting there and going, well, I think this is what happens with a DDoS isn't a good thing. I mean, we sat there and did a lot of I thinks this happens. We talked about what they would need. They would need a computer and an internet connection. And I think we stopped right there because they're like, well, they need some money to buy you know, the infrastructure. Well, that's basically free these days. Uh, they need, you know, some knowledge. Well, as we've seen so far, that's basically free these days. So all they really need is an internet connection and a computer. Although I really want to find out when someone has a starts a DDoS from like their PS2 or something, I will promise I will be laughing hysterically. Although I really enjoy this whole thing. It's still a political act today. DDoS is still the... I want to knock the other guy off the net. It is used in the Gaza conflict. It is used by both Russia and Ukraine. And it's not money being gained out of this. The person who's attacking Russia or the person who's attacking Ukraine is not actually getting money out of this. They are basically trying to knock the other person off the net because of the conflict. Now, I will say, and I didn't put this in a slide because I have no evidence for this, but I have been told at conferences, side note, go to conferences, talk to people. It's really interesting, the things you can learn. But I have been told at conferences that uh, there are some companies, especially those that are kind of skirting on the edge, like um, offshore gambling, that pay protection money so they won't be DDoSed. So essentially there's money being gained by threatening to DDoS. But once you, you know, buck up and DDoS the guys, you're not getting anything. It's the threat of, of saying, I am going to DDoS this person that is actually making the money. The DDoS itself, there's not any money going on unless you're also selling your anti-DDoS service so that people will buy. So you won't do it. So it's protection money again. It's still a scary thing though. I mean, I'm, I actually was doing this talk and going, well, I hope no one DDoSes me today because I really would like to get through it because I really enjoy this talk. Beyond DDoS, I didn't stop at just DDoS doing my grip for evil. It makes sense that these people would advertise themselves, right? They want you to buy a DDoS from them. So there has to be a website so you can buy the DDoS. Yay! So I went looking for botnets because botnets is sort of in that middle thing, right? Sometimes you want to buy a botnet because you want to use the botnet to, you know, mine Bitcoin or you want to buy the botnet for other, you want to spend, send spam. But Sometimes there isn't. So I just went looking for botnets because, well, it's another thing I could look for. Um, on a side note, back to the side notes, looking for Trojan in a set of DNS names is not actually something that will gain you very much interesting results because so many schools have Trojans as their mascot. So what I got back was a ton of domains for various schools. And there may have been some bad stuff in there, but it was so little, I gave up looking, uh, which is base rate fallacy, guys. When you do cybersecurity, you've got to know and love the base rate fallacy of how little actually occurs in the great scheme of things. So botnets. Here we have botnet.cc, a relative revolutionary IP test platform. I think they want to DDoS you. They're just not saying it. This is site doesn't exist anymore. Like I said, a lot of these sites, they come, they go, they come, they go. So botnet.cc. 
Botnet Service X. We are the best of our job because our botnet is for everyone and you can actually contact us through this various ways. These guys aren't around either, I don't think. But they also have ransomware available on their botnet site <laughs> or had botnet ransomware. And I found ransomware and started laughing hysterically because, you know, it's $100 to buy one locker. It's $200 to buy multi-locker. And $250 for silent win locker. Let's buy some ransomware. Yeah, that went back to the previous discussion with my boss. So if we're not using federal money to send it to the bad guys, even if it will give us information we could use. Sometimes I have also is no fun. But I did go looking for botnet service X again. The site I showed you is no longer in existence. However, I did find YouTube have had this, and I also found this. Uh, that is the blog spot address mentioned in this YouTube video. The botnetservicex.com doesn't exist anymore, but you can go get it. And um, I will say they have Zeus for 250, which last time I checked, guys, isn't Zeus on GitHub? I can get Zeus for nothing, but that requires some knowledge to set Zeus up. So I'm assuming they would actually be polite enough to help me set up Zeus if I had a mad urge to set up Zeus. <clears throat> but, you know, they also have other ransomwares available. Multi-locker, WinLocker, again, WinLocker. Remember, 2018 was when I did this other research and they still have WinLocker. And isn't that a sort of, we're not really protecting well against in locker win locker thing. If people are still trying to sell you win locker to use, not the greatest of things. I also, when I was doing my research before, found the Cythosia botnet, botnet. I did not find the site again, but I was entertained by the fact that on the Cythosia botnet, all this information about setting up your own and your control panel and installing it, there's also ads. So even the bad guys got to sell ads to keep online. I don't know who was selling their ads, but that's another story. Then I also recently went looking for the uh, Cythosia botnet, and this is what I found. Um, yeah, I, I'm still not allowed to buy botnets. Boss is no fun sometimes. I found the MariahBotnet.eu with benefits of choosing me because he's always on daily, ready to provide sales and support at any given time. So one of the things I learned at a conference was that um, a lot of these um, malicious actors, well, not a lot of them, but some of them actually have tech support. So if you get hit by the ransomware and you pay it off and you're having problems unlocking, you can contact their tech support that will help you. Help you. Probably for more money. I'm not sure they actually do anything worthwhile. So this is another favorite one of mine, freetrojanbotnet.com. This is actually the one that started me searching for domains with Trojan in them once I found this, because I found this through Botnet. And freetrojanbotnet.com is a list of badware. And uh, yeah, that's fun. In 2024, I found it again. Now, I don't know if this is, you know, a place to download because, you know, there's a lot of uh, sharing of free malicious swear. I mean, GitHub is so full. In my second book, there is a chapter on malware analysis, and every sample that was used in that chapter came from one of three GitHub repositories. So I just kind of looked at this and went, okay, I'm not downloading anything because I'm not really feeling um, like I want to put a botnet on my computer this week, so I'll just let the coworkers know who do this for a living that there might be another site that they can go for. And here's another picture of it because I clicked on one. Just curiosity will get me one of these days. Um, but, you know, um, yeah, share files with ease, another ad. Then I went to botnet.ro because this is what is one of the domains I found using that method I missed it before, where I just went through every TLD and said, okay, does botnet.ro 
CC exist? No. Okay. Does botnet.ro exist? By the way, the answer is yes. However, according to Cloudflare, it's currently down. And I will remind you, Cloudflare is anti-DDoS. So I'm not going to go into speculate why they have botnet and uh, .ro on their website. Not even going there. Then we also have botnet.shop. Connection timed out. Again, not even going to guess why they have it, but again, it's a cloud flare. And I will also tell you at one point for interesting things in the passive DNS data set, I grepped for anyone using ns1.cloudflare.com as their name server and said, hmm, what's in this set? The CEO of Cloudflare is on record as saying he will not reject any of his customers. He Once they're his customer, he will not throw them off. He threw a um, many years, well, a few years ago, he threw off a white supremacist site after a lot of politicking from people. Oh, this is a bad thing. It was a very bad thing. And afterwards, he's like, you know, that was a bad thing. I shouldn't have done that. I should not have thrown off a customer. I'm there. So essentially what Cloudflare is telling us is that they're going to be bulletproof hosting located in the U.S., so that's one way of finding Bulletproof, anyone using Bulletproof hosting, are they using Cloudflare? This one's one of my favorites because I was going through Botnet and I threw this in here because it's actually sort of a negative result. And I was also laughing while I found it. This is Vietnamese and I'm checking my notes. It says the, the words are bold flavor of rice. So as a um, suspicious person, I was like, well, that's one way of hiding yourself from selling botnets. Claim you are a restaurant and you have a menu and no one's going to go past that because they'll see the menu. So I should click on the menu to find out what kind of botnets they're actually selling. Because Did I mention I'm suspicious? Yeah, suspicion will get me every time. Well, this is either an actual restaurant or the strangest way of putting botnets I've ever seen in my life because... Um, there's chicken curry rice, braised meat rice, and chicken ginger rice, I believe, assuming that Google Translate didn't leave me wrong. So I am going to take a wild guess here that they don't think they're a botnet site. However, I did not click on the phone or Facebook to see what was up. I just was entertained at my thought process for is this a bad guy or is this, you know, not. And I think I'm gonna go with not. Although I guess I really should order the, um, let's see, the the ginger rice. No, the ginger curry rice. That, I think I wanna try that. Here's another one. I love this one. This is like one of my favorite all time things I have found ever searching the internet. Admiral at bar, it's a Trappist ale. I love this. Fishdown.com, this site is still up. You can go click on it and take a look at it. Yes, they're still there. There's a Facebook page. You can email the Admiral if you want. But uh, this is what happened when I went grepping for fish. And this was the most interesting thing I found when I went grepping for fish. So I don't think there's any fishing websites out there with the word fish in them at the time. There may be now, but remember, like I said, there's quick cycle on these sites. So there may have been one and it's gone. Domains, malicious domains have a very short uh, shelf life, especially those used for spam. Uh, Paul Vixie, who is one of the originators of the DNS protocol told me once that if you block all new domains for 24 hours, your, the amount of spam you get will go down so dramatically. So they buy the domain, use the domain, discard the domain. So back in the old days of the internet, you used to buy a domain and then you had to wait for a day or two for it to propagate appropriately because we didn't have these huge pipes we have now. We had littler pipes. And then once it was propagated, you could use it and discard it if you discarded it, but they used to last a bit longer. These days it's used, gone, used, gone, used, gone. So by the time some of these end up on blacklists, they're already discarded. No one's using them anymore. They may be still registered, but no one's actually using them. What about ransomware? 
Okay. Why on earth would someone put ransomware, the word ransomware in a domain name? I grepped for ransomware in the domain name. Because like I said, I had grep. And I was entertaining myself. And I'm very easily entertained. Just ask Faf. Do not go to these sites. For record, these sites don't exist anymore. But just generally don't go to these sites. Microsoft protection from ransomware.info. Warning. Zeus de virus detected in your computer. Oh my God, I've been hit by Zeus because I went to this domain. Oh no, what do I do? And I will tell you when I first went to this domain, I went, wait, wait. Oh, okay. It's just a domain. It's a splash page. I didn't. Phew. Okay. Maybe I should just re-image the system to be safe. <laughs> a little bit of paranoia when this thing flashes up on your screen, even if you're in the business, because I was going to some very interesting websites and I ended up on this one. So, uh, the following data will be compromised if you continue. Passwords, browser history, credit card information, local hard disk files. Well, like I said, this was not a system I used every day and it was disposable. So there wasn't anything on it for them to take. But hey, if they wanted it, it was welcome to it. They could learn about, you know, botnet.cc. Be happy. But then there's the phone number, 888-441-1595. I said, okay, I have a piece of information I can do something with. What is this phone number? That phone number is a mail order bride service or was. It belonged to behappytoday.com. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, um, not, they weren't exactly there to help you <laughs> with ransomware. <laughs> they were probably there to help you with other things, but they were not actually happy to help you with ransomware. Then I found another one ransomware threat detected remove it now.info. Uh, this one worried me a little less because I clearly was not on a Microsoft system at the time. I was on a Linux system. and uh, But there's a phone number again. There's a phone number and, you know, it's a warning saying, hey, I've been infected. All Microsoft products have been infected. Great. Worry about that number. So it goes to either Microsoft or Apple or iTunes or there was a list of people it could have belonged to. There was no, this piece number belongs to these people. This was, oh, at this point it was saying they were Microsoft. At this point they were saying they're Apple. At this point it's saying iTunes. I'm going to go out on a limb. It's a big limb and say, not good. This was, you know, bad. But I don't really have any other evidence <laughs> other than the domain name, ransomware threat detector, remove it now.com with this really cool splash page to worry everyone and the fact that the number didn't mean anything and was not you know i was not infected because i wasn't using a windows box i could have but i also went and looked for ransomware in text records i looked for the word ransomware in text records like i said i had a passive dns data set i had all the name server records i had text records I could have, I was having fun. It's kind of obvious I was having a lot of fun with this, isn't it? <laughs> so I just grepped in this text record and what I got was a URL and I clicked on that URL and I found this. It's the index of slash ransomware. The URL was, I forget what it was, slash ransomware. I got this, I said, huh. And so then, because I work with a bunch of very, very smart people in the malware department, I pulled down all these EXEs, handed them over to them, including the .zip and not an evil .file, mainly because I just wanted to include that in the list, and said, hey, guys, what is this? And they came back and said, thank you for the ransomware. We didn't have those samples. So I do not understand why someone would put a URL to ransomware in a text record unless it's a way of sharing it. Text records are very much the notepads of the internet. I have found all sorts of weird things in text records and um, I once got rickrolled going to a URL I found in a text record. And I laughed and went back to work. But yeah, text records are fun. So... Another thing I learned in all of this 
is do not go to sites with both bank and login in the name. Bankofamerica.com.login.signin.etc. etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I got a nice splash that said deceptive site ahead. Don't go to this. And of course, because I'm a researcher and that's my excuse today, I went to it anyway. That's what I got. And that looks very much like the Bank of America site at the time. It is not the Bank of America site. I mean, look, they have everything on here. I mean, they have up to $1,000 a year on your credit card and taking down the heavy lifting out of moving. I mean, it really looks like the Bank of America website. And then I found this one, which is PNC Banking. And it also has, look at that, PNC Bank-Online-Banking-Login. And so I went to it too, because obviously I, um, and it got dark all of a sudden, guys. I'm sorry, I didn't realize there. Uh, I went to PNC. I said, hey, what is this PNC website? What are they doing? Because, you know, researcher, and that's my excuse, and I'm sticking with it. I got this. Now, this doesn't really look like a PNC bank online at the time. I have a PNC bank account. Didn't really look like it, but I was totally enthralled by the fact that they made a website. And neither of these were actually bank sites, but they were very nice to tell me that they were bank sites. And zero days. What I mean, I'm having, seriously, I was having a grand time. I'd wander around to my coworkers and say, what goofy string should I look for next? I mean, I've done, you know, booters, stressors, DDoS, botnet. I tried Trojan, which we clearly didn't work. Then I threw in bank and login at the same time. And someone said, well, there's zero days. Have you done any of that? And I went, not lately. Let's try some zero days. I found a website that promised to sell me some. Zero day to day. Now, here's the fun thing. First of all, you can buy a zero day here. Still exists. Look what that nice splash screen says. It's verify you're a human and Cloudflare. So um, I did actually click on that and verify I was human. And it looks very similar to the previous one, although they're now taking more than just Bitcoin. So that's interesting. Um, still can't convince anyone to let me buy this stuff, but you know, one of these days I'll find the right people who <laughs> will say, here, Lee, here's some money you can give to the bad guys so we can find out what they're really up to. So it looks really easy, right? I just grepped. It's the easiest thing in the world to sit there at a command line and grep. And I highly recommend if you, someone hands you a data set, or if you're starting any research, just look at the data and grep. But I found DDoS, I found botnets, I found ransomware, I found zero days. And that's not even including some malware I found, which the malware team, again, thanked me very much because I found some things they didn't have. So it looks so easy. This is like an easy thing to do, just sit there and grab and hand some names off and hand some URLs off. And I handed the ransomware off and they were happy that I'd done it. But here's the thing. At the time, I was working on blacklists. And we have reports on uh, the CERT website going back to 2012 for blacklists. We had 2012 to 2017. I did six years, basically, of blacklists. First thing we discovered was that very few of these lists actually agree. There's like this blacklist will cover this amount of information, and this blacklist will cover that information, but there's very little intersection between the two. So that was actually something people were not aware of when we started this. The first blacklist report, I'm, I'm going to warn you because I should, the first blacklist report is 300 pages. The first 12 pages of it is the interesting part. The rest of it is we were trying to find any way to intersect these blacklists and couldn't. It's also entitled everything you wanted to know about blacklists but were afraid to ask. I titled that as a joke. It actually made it out the door that way. I was very shocked. But still, I have all these domain name blacklists and that I was looking at. And at the end of this, at 2017, the last half of 2017, I had 
40 million plus unique indicators, unique domain names that are on blacklists. Now, yes, that sounds like a lot of domains, right? I mean, 40 million is not small, but one thing to consider is that is there's a potential Google, not Google, Google, G one with a hundred zeros after it, number of domain names, okay? And there's probably even more these days because there's so many TLDs. When that report was written saying that there was a potential of one plus a hundred zeros afterward, the only do, uh, TLDs we had at the time were the standards, com, net, mobi, org, et cetera, and country TLDs. Now we have what, I don't know, 600 and something TLDs. We have so many TLDs. So there's so many potential domains out there that 40 million is not even a drop in the bucket when it comes to looking at domain names. It's a base rate fallacy all over again. When people say I have a method of finding a malicious domain name, base rate fallacy will hit you every time. I'm not even finding a dent. I mean, I'm not even finding a dent in the bucket and the, in the molecule of drop in the bucket. I am just having fun and I'm saying, Hey, this looks easy, but I'm not finding anything close to the amount that's actually out there. So I have actually had management say to me, and not my management, but at other companies and at previous jobs, um, and why is this so hard? Why do you want all this money? This is an easy thing. Heck, I clicked on the wrong thing. I found the bad domain yesterday. And I have to say that that number there is the reason why it's so hard. It's not that, yes, it's hard to find. It's not hard to find these things if you're looking for them, but there's so many of them, we're not even coming close to the number of them that are actually out there. Finding the bad guys that are hiding is hard. The ones that wanna sell us things, the ones that aren't hiding is not hard. And I recently went back on the tour network just because it's been a while. And uh, the last time I was on there was before Alpha Bay was taken down. And I was actually pretty peeved when they took Alpha Bay down because that actually was a lot of research for me, was just finding things on Alpha Bay. But it's still there too. And it's still cheap, depending on what the Bitcoin is that week. So any questions? And by the way, don't go to domains with both bank and login M. I actually did some searching recently and didn't find any. So hopefully there's no more of those. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, if people are running, particularly on a platform that may have some unpatched kind of issues or browsers, they could actually compromise their system by visiting a place they aren't uh, aware of what may be there. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, maybe because everybody's busy out there visiting websites. <laughs> um, I, I, I well, uh, laughing at my screenshot. I can bring up the DDoS ninja again, if guys, if you want. <laughs> no, that's that's all right. I, I, I do think your your mention, however, that article about uh, the article in Wired. Um, I, I would recommend that to people to read. It's it's a very interesting article about the DDoS business and how the FBI ended up tracking down the authors. And there's a couple of Q and A's that have popped up. So um, Lee, do you want to read those uh, or do you want me to read them to you? Uh, let's see if I can see them. Here we go. Where might the young, even well-seasoned aspiring researchers find similar data sets to explore? Um, so that actually is a hard question right now. And um, because I actually went looking and I am pretty good at finding data sets. Um, I have found some, um, you can get all the CTTLDs, the new ones, the new domains, excuse me, the new TLDs. I forget the actual website to log on to, but if you basically say you're from Purdue and you're doing it for research and here's your research, you can get all the new TLD domain files. Okay, that's a lot of domains there. Um, I did find some other DN sources that uh, I was not entirely impressed with what I found. Um, I found one place that offered me like the three top million TLDs, Alexa, which is no longer really being uh, supported. And there was Radar and I forget number three. And the problem with using top one million TLDs uh, domains is how do they make that list? Uh, 
I mean, Alexa claims it's the most visited websites is what they were using. And there was another one that's using, it was Quantcast was um, actually using um, people who would actually agree to put a uh, plugin on their browser and they would count visitors that way to some of these websites. But of course, that's a convenient sample of people willing to actually do that. And it wasn't the top 1 million. The last time I downloaded it was maybe 350,000. Yeah, some of the uh, some of the name server providers uh, will will provide those lists, but you have to uh, have a research agreement with them. They aren't just generally out and available. We uh, had a research agreement with Verisign because we're cert, and then they let us have it for free. But I understood they started charging for some of that at one point, so we stopped. But yeah, it's uh, um, it's hard to find domain names to play with. I would say if somebody has a specific project they're interested in, um, a Purdue student, contact me um, because I, I believe I know a place, but I'm not going to name publicly here where we could get them. Let's see, the next question is, do you have any recommendations for protecting self-hosted publicly accessible services against DDoS attacks? Not really, no. That's not my research area. I'm more of a historical, this thing happened, let's figure out why and, and tell people about it so they learn from it. <laughs> they learn from it, staff. <laughs> I'm sorry, people rarely learn because I keep seeing the same problems, but they learn from it and things go forward in the future. But I haven't really looked at um, actually defending. Um, when the DDoS issue came up at CERT, I was really basically the the curmudgeon in the corner going, okay, so what are these DDoSs we're actually defending against? There are some low level free services through Google and um, Cloudflare, but you can also pay for higher levels of service if, if that's actually a concern. Um, I'm, you, can, you can look up Online, you can do a search for DDoS protection and you will find um, some legitimate companies that do that. Uh, we have hit the end of our time and the end of our questions, uh, which is a nice coincidence. Thank you so much, Lee, for, uh, for this uh, really fascinating tour of the availability of malicious operators in the public internet. Um, and fun with standard tools. Uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to what whatever you come up with next. And I would invite everyone who enjoyed the seminar to tune in next week at this time where we'll have another speaker. So thank you, Lee. And to everyone, have a good evening. Try to stay warm. Thanks, guys. <laughs>